Hello everyone, we are kicking off a new year. It is 2020 and uh, for this calendar year, we're gonna be diving into a, pretty much a full calendar year journey together. We're calling it the grand story and we're gonna be uh, basically working through the entirety of scripture. Obviously, we won't be covering every chapter, every verse as we go, but we, I thought it would be good over this calendar year to kind of get a renewed sort of 2020 vision of the full arc, the full narrative, the full trajectory of Scripture, culminating, of course, in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, and to take this journey together. Uh, one thing I've noticed in our 21st century Canadian culture is that uh, there's a high degree of biblical illiteracy and maybe even more problematic, there's a high degree of people misunderstanding what the Bible is, how to read it, how to interpret it, how to let it serve as a vehicle, as it's rightly meant to be a witness and a vehicle which brings us uh, deeper in relationship with God and in uh, participating in God in his mission on the world. And so we're calling this series, we're calling this sort of journey this year, the grand story. And before we dive into uh, the first couple chapters of Genesis, I thought it would be good, much like we did last year when we walked through the last book of the Bible, uh, the Revelation, um, to spend a couple weeks just what we're calling packing and unpacking for the journey. Much like when we uh, dipped our toes into the enigmatic, often misunderstood book of Revelation, there were some things we needed to unpack and there were some things we needed to repack. I think even more so that's true as we set out to take this journey through the grand story of the biblical narrative at large. And so today we're simply asking the questions, what is the Bible and what isn't the Bible? And next week, we're going to probe a little more deeper on how to read the Bible and understand the Bible. What are some tools that we can put in our tool belt, so to speak, to help us uh, to quote uh, a book that I read back in seminary, read the Bible for all that it's worth. And it certainly is worth much. There's great value. There's great wisdom in reading the Bible. And uh, we'll start today simply by asking, what is the Bible? But sometimes when you're trying to identify what something is, in this case, the Bible, we can go right to talking about what it is. But I want to first talk about uh, what it isn't. And sadly, what it has been... Uh, misunderstood to be both in our contemporary world and throughout the history of Christianity and in the history of people relating with uh, the holy text. And so let's talk about three things the Bible is not this morning. First, the Bible is not and is never meant to be a weapon. Now, sadly, uh, the Bible has been weaponized both throughout history. It continues to be used as a weapon today, whether it's in debates, conversations, face-to-face uh, -face conversations, social media posts and conversations. Oftentimes, the Bible or a certain part of the Bible, uh, pick a chapter, pick a verse to justify a position, justify interpretation, uh, to... Uh, slander or condemn a person or a people group, we can and do sadly use the Bible as a weapon. Uh, I recall back in my Bible college days uh, studying church history and some days it was the most encouraging class, some days it was the most discouraging class and I would literally come home in tears or frustrated and angry with how the church had misrepresented Christ in church history. Certainly the church has been at its best when it has read and interpreted scripture to point to Jesus and use Jesus as sort of a lens through which all scripture can be read and interpreted. More on that next week, but sadly, uh, the church has used scripture in a way that is very unchristlike. It's been weaponized, it's been used to dehumanize others. And whenever uh, a biblical text is used to dehumanize another person created in the image and likeness of Christ, that is not a proper way of reading and understanding and using scripture. Uh, C.S. Lewis, a famous uh, writer uh, and apologist, um, he says these words, a lot of wisdom here. He says, it is Christ himself, not the Bible, who is the true word of God. More on that in a couple minutes. The Bible read in the right spirit, implying it can be read in the wrong spirit, and with the guidance of good teachers, the Holy Spirit being the ultimate teacher, 
will bring us to him, bring us to Christ. We must not use the Bible as a sort of encyclopedia out of which texts can be taken for use as weapons. The reality is that we can cobble together a verse here and a verse there, a chapter here, a chapter there. We can rip it out of its context and out of the trajectory of where Scripture is moving and heading, devoid of the guidance of the Spirit and read in healthy community under the guidance of teachers. And we can use it like an encyclopedia. We can use it to dehumanize and harm and condemn the other, whoever the other might be. Uh, I just go to Exhibit A, the Crusades. Um, lots of scripture, particularly in the Old Testament passages from the conquest of the promised land have been used out of context in a way that is unchristlike to justify one nation going to war with another nation. Uh, the holy wars throughout history. Uh, slavery. You know, those of you who have read scripture closely will see that scripture not once ever in the Old Testament or the New Testament never clearly renounces and denounces slavery. Does that mean slavery is legitimate? A relationship between people? Well, no. I mean, reading scripture, understanding scripture, and looking at the ethics of Christ, we would say no. And yet, uh, through the abolitionist movement and through the Civil War in America, we saw a number of Christians who uh, conveniently were slaveholders and slave owners going to the Bible to justify their actions and to justify having a master and slave relationship. Uh, Frederick Douglass, one of the more famous uh, Christian apologists and abolitionists, he says these words, this is a very telling critique of when Christianity uh, gives into the allure of using the Bible as a weapon and where cultural Christianity can be at odds with Christianity as Christ teaches us. He says, between the Christianity of this land, speaking of America in the late 1800s, and the Christianity of Christ, I recognize the widest possible difference. So wide that to receive the one as good, pure, and holy is of necessity to reject the other as bad, corrupt, and wicked. To be the friend of one is of necessity to be the enemy of the other. I love the pure, peaceable, and impartial Christianity of Christ, Douglas says. I therefore hate the corrupt, slaveholding, woman whipping, cradle plundering, partial, and hypocritical Christianity of this land. Indeed, I can see no reason but the most deceitful one calling the religion of this land Christianity. And so that's Douglas rightfully uh, calling out and identifying the wide gap between the Christianity of Christ and the Christianity of our land as he describes it during his lifetime. And sadly, we still see evidence today where the Bible continues to be misused as a weapon. I get on my Twitter feed or social media feed, Facebook feed on literally a daily basis. I see some healthy life-giving conversations, but I also see uh, some conversations where what I call truth bombs are simply being launched. And usually they're launched to pick a fight, to argue, to take the moral high ground. Uh, at the expense of another person, another people group, another part of the body of Christ even. Uh, this is not the correct way to understand Scripture. The Bible is never meant to be a weapon. Secondly, the Bible is not meant to be read and understood as sort of a magic pill or a, a medicine bottle. And sadly, I've seen this, I've experienced this uh, in my life where scripture verses are sort of like magic pills. You just you take your scripture pill, your daily scripture pill, and that will make all things well. You'll have a good day. You'll be blessed, healthy, and, and wealthy. Uh, potentially, even we have sort of some streams of Christianity that promote this sort of health and wealth gospel, that if you just read and claim particular scripture verses, almost like taking your medicine pill daily, uh, that will cure all that ails you. And certainly the witness and the testimony of Jesus suggests otherwise. Certainly Jesus himself went through trials and hardships, uh, his life culminating in a humiliating, painful death on the cross. Uh, Jesus himself said, in this world you will have trials. And so reading the Bible, meditating on the Bible, allowing our minds to be renewed, rightfully so, by Scripture, uh, and our hearts to be filled as sort of a means of God's grace, uh, uh, spurring us on towards Christ and his mission in the world is a good and right thing to do. 
but we can take that to the extreme when we wrongly see scripture as a medicine bottle or a magic pill. Um, oftentimes we can formulize scriptures, we can turn scripture passages and the wisdom of scripture, because there's great wisdom in scripture, we can turn into nice neatly packaged formula, gift wrapped. Uh, sometimes we do this with the book of Proverbs in particular. Uh, one, one passage in Proverbs that comes to mind that uh, parents who are seeing their children go through rough patches and waywardness and seasons of their life, they often sort of refer back to this scripture as sort of a locked in formulaic promise that all will be well. Proverbs 22.6 says, train up a child or train children in the right way. And when old, they will not stray. And when we turn those wisdom sayings, which are what the Proverbs are, they're wisdom sayings, when we turn them into form and turn them into locked in promises, but we can sort of distort and turn scripture, or certainly that portion of scripture and other portions, into a medicine bottle, into sort of scripture pills that we just sort of claim. We name them, we claim them by faith, and, uh, but yet scripture was never meant to be a magic pill. It's not meant to be a medicine bottle. Um, certainly there's wise advice there. I do my part and hopefully all God-fearing, God-loving parents will try to train up the children, will try to model Christ to their children. Uh, and that increases, certainly, I believe, the likelihood that, that children will see the love of Christ in their parents at a young age, and they will choose to continue to walk in the way of Jesus. But the reality is there's this thing called free will, which God bestows all children because love involves free will and is never controlling or coercive, which implies that there always is a possibility. There's a possibility that children will turn the wrong way for a season, and sadly, perpetually. They will continue to do so. That is a reality. And so um, as much as scripture is full of wisdom and advice uh, for parenting and otherwise, uh, we, we, should, we would do well not to turn scripture passages like this and other ones into magic pills and medicine bottles to, to uh, sort of fix everything that ails us and to make sure our life is coming up roses. That is not the reality of scripture. Certainly that's not the reality of the characters of the journey in scripture. And that's not the reality of the human experience as well. So scripture is not to be used as a weapon. It's not to be used as a magic pill or medicine bottle. And thirdly, uh, this is not an exhaustive list, but a third and final example of what scripture is not I wanted to share today is that scripture is not some sort of a magic book. Just as it's not a magic pill, it's not a magic book. Now I've got a quote from, uh, this is, this is D.A. Carson. Now, I don't always agree with what Carson has to say. He's, a, he's an evangelical, conservative, biblical scholar. Um, and even coming from a very conservative biblical scholar, you may expect this from more of a progressive biblical scholar, but this is Carson, a card-carrying, evangelical, conservative, a biblical scholar and theologian. He says these words. These are very telling. He says, Some who go by the name of, quote, evangelical, view the Bible in such scrappy, atomistic bits that they can find moralizing lessons here and there, but cannot see how the Bible gives us the gospel, which means good news, of Jesus Christ. But the Bible is not, Carson says, a magic book, as in a verse a day keeps the devil away. It is a book that points us to Jesus, and this Jesus saves and transforms. This Jesus, by his death and resurrection, constitutes the good news that men and women may be reconciled to the living God. Now, I grew up in a, a conservative evangelical environment, and I'm grateful for that in many respects, in many regards. I saw the love of Christ modeled to me, but the Bible was sometimes sort of elevated to almost a position of being a magic book that there was some inherent sort of power within the actual text itself, uh, where I've come to see that it's not the text itself that has the power, but it's reading the text through the eyes of faith, illuminated by the Holy Spirit and done in healthy community that should rightly lead us closer to Christ and to be engaged in God's redemptive mission in the world at large. However, I still see in many places in the body of Christ and certainly in the evangelical church where scripture is used as sort of a magic book. 
and you don't debate the scripture, you don't wrestle with the scripture, you certainly don't train change your interpretation of certain passages of scripture, uh, you, don't, you don't call the Bible anything less than in the inerrant word of God, and we'll talk more about right and wrong ways to understanding inspiration uh, next week. Um, but I think we would do well not to see the Bible as a magic book per se, a book of wisdom, a book of grace and mercy and love, certainly in many regards and in many respects, but not a magic book, as Carson critiques here. So if the Bible is not a weapon, it's not a medicine bottle or magic pill, it's not a, bad, a magic book, how do we rightly understand what the Bible is? Well, here is what I would call the sort of the bare minimum standard of what the Bible is. And this is certainly coming from someone within the Christian faith. Now, there are many who would say the Bible is simply a historical document. Uh, it tells us about some ancient cultures, and it certainly does that. But coming from a Christian perspective, I believe here is the bare minimum standard of how we should understood the Bible read through the lens of faith. Uh, the Bible is a, the story, actually it's multiple stories, it's not really a book, it's a library of books. The story of God's, what I would say, unfolding revelation and redemptive love. So on the one hand it tells us something about God, and God is unfolding his revelation to the people of God. And on the other hand, it's humanity's journey. The Bible, we need to see it as a journey. It's moving somewhere. It's on a journey. It's on a trajectory. It's humanity's journey of discovering who God is. And so on that journey of self-discovery and on that journey as God is uh, unfolding the revelation of God's self, um, we'll see some right steps forward and we'll see some missteps. And we shouldn't be surprised. That shouldn't surprise us when we see the, the authors of scripture inspired by God, but freely writing how they see and understand God, it shouldn't surprise us that they get some things right on that journey. And if we're honest, we can say they get some things wrong on that journey. Because that's my experience, that's your experience. That is the human experience. The God who is love that doesn't coerce, control, or micromanage individuals, and I would suggest doesn't even micromanage uh, scripture, it respects our humanity, inspires, is influencing all over. We see the fingerprints of God's love and mercy throughout Scripture. There's through lines throughout Scripture, but it's also humanity's journey of discovering who God is and who God isn't. And certainly that journey, that trajectory, it culminates in the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus, the one we can rightly uh, give the title of the living word of God. Now, I want to revisit that quote from C.S. Lewis. Uh, he said, it is Christ himself, not the Bible, who is the true word of God. And I would agree with C.S. Lewis wholeheartedly that the word of God is Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the second person of the Trinity. Now, many of us, maybe if you grew up in the church, we simply, without even giving it a second thought, we refer to the Bible as the inspired written word of God. Um, the last few years, I have tried to refrain from using the expression word of God to describe the Bible. Now, hear me out for those of you who are appalled that I would say that. I don't have a low view of scripture. I have a very high view of scripture. But the reality is, that within the pages of scripture, primarily in the New Testament itself, when scripture speaks and uses the expression word of God, it more often than not is not referring to the text, it's referring to Jesus, the Christ, the second person of the, the Trinity, incarnated, coming and dwelling among us. Let me go to Hebrews chapter 4. This is a sort of case in point here. And this is a passage where I grew up thinking that clearly Hebrews 4, 12 and 13 is referring to the written Bible as we have it uh, and as we use it. It says, indeed, the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing until it divides soul from spirit, joints from marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. So it's using it language here. It's talking about it. Seems like it's talking about an inanimate object seems to be talking about scripture. However, in the following verse, it changes from it 
to the personal pronoun of him. And before him no creation is hidden. But all are naked and laid bare to the eyes of the one to whom we must render an account. That's Hebrews 4, 12, and 13. It changes from it language to him language, and the Greek word for word in this case is logos. And if we parallel this passage of scripture with how John's gospel begins, John begins his gospel by saying, in the beginning was the word, logos, same Greek word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Clearly, this passage also is not referring to the Bible. In the beginning was the Bible, and the Bible was with God, and the Bible was God. No, it's referring to Jesus. It's referring to the second person of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so when Scripture in these passages and other instances is, is speaking of the Word, the Logos of God, it's not speaking of a text, it's not speaking of a book, it's speaking of God. Rightly understood, Jesus, capital W, is the living Word of God. And as we take this journey through the grand story, we want to ensure that we keep Christ at the center. We want to ensure that no matter which portion of Scripture we are looking into, we're reading, we're meditating upon, we're trying to pull out some wisdom and some inspiration and some application, we want to ensure that wherever we land, whatever, however we rightly try and understood those particular passage, rule number one, is that it aligns with what we know about God in the revelation of Christ, the living word of God. There are two extremes I want us to avoid, and I see this in the life of the church today. There's two sort of ditches that we need to avoid. One is that we elevate Scripture beyond what Scripture tells us it should be elevated to, where we elevate Scripture almost to a place where it can be an idol. And it sounds sort of counterintuitive, but I've seen this, and this has been the case in my own life, where the Bible itself can be idolatrous. Of course, it's not the Bible, but our certain way of understanding and elevating the Bible to a place where it's on par with the Godhead. And there was a time even in my life where, uh, I wouldn't say this, but as I look back, the Holy Trinity was not Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but it was Father, Son, and Holy Bible. And that is idolatrous because the Holy Trinity, God in three parts, is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Bible is meant to be a primary witness to Jesus, the Word of God. But the Bible itself is not the living Word of God. So that's one extreme where we can put the Bible sort of on a pedestal above where it's meant to be. The other extreme, however, which is very prevalent in our society, is not that the Bible is an idol, but the Bible is simply ignored. It stays on the shelf, it collects dust, it's not read, it's not meditated upon, uh, it's not used as a proper means of grace to use our Wesleyan language to sort of lead us into a deeper relationship with God and propel us on mission with God. It can be ignored. And so we're going to try and avoid those two ditches. And somewhere between those two ditches is where we rightly understand Scripture as this unfolding revelation of God's love, His redemptive love throughout the course of history, as it's received, as it's wrestled with, as it's understood, and at times misunderstood by those to whom God is revealing God's self to. And we read Scripture as a witness to that journey. That journey culminates in the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. And because that is the culmination of the journey, we need to start and properly understand the life, the death, the resurrection of Christ. And through the lens of Christ crucified, sort of this Christocentric, what we call it, and cruciform hermeneutic lens. When I say hermeneutic, that's the lens through which we view the rest of the story. We'll unpack those concepts next week. Uh, but hopefully that will help give us a more robust, a more healthy understanding, and we will resist the temptation to ever use the Bible as a weapon, to ever use it as a medicine bottle, bottle or a magic pill, to use it as some sort of formulaic magic book, and perhaps we'll rightly understand Scripture 
as uh, something that is inspired and can be used by the Holy Spirit to draw us closer in our relationship with God and to grow in our capacity to love our neighbors in a way that is imitative of Christ, who is the living and active Word of God. And so that's sort of our introduction to this grand story uh, series we'll be embarking on this next year. Hopefully that's some good food for thought. Uh, next week we'll be talking a little more about how. How then? Properly understanding what the Bible is, uh, what are some tools and some tips that we can put sort of in our toolbox to help us as we embark on this journey throughout understanding scripture and how to read it for all that it's worth. So I hope uh, you'll join us on this journey. I hope you'll continue to reflect on this. Let's not make the Bible an idol. Let's not ignore it and keep it on the shelf. Let's read and engage it on a daily basis, but recognizing that it is a vehicle. The fuel is the Holy Spirit, which can bring us closer to Christ and his mission in the world.